Hello, my name is Sue Williams and I'm an author and a journalist and I write mostly non-fiction but I have my first adult novel coming out in January. Um, it's an historical fiction called Elizabeth and Elizabeth published by Alan and Unwin about an imagined friendship between two of the leading women of the colony of New South Wales which later became Australia. The first woman is Elizabeth Macquarie, the wife of Governor Lachlan Macquarie, and they arrived in 1810, just after the Rum Rebellion unseated the former governor, William Bly. Um, one of the rebellion leaders was John MacArthur. The second Elizabeth is Elizabeth MacArthur, um, the wife of John MacArthur. And when the Macquaries arrived, um, Elizabeth MacArthur and John MacArthur had already been in New South Wales for 20 years. Western Sydney is incredibly important in those early days as it was the site of the second government house where the Macquarie's came to live after the birth, the birth of their one child. And it was the home of the MacArthur's and their Waller Empire. They moved to Parramatta where they established Elizabeth Farm, which will become famous for its merino fleeces. And that Elizabeth Farm is still around today and the, the government house in Parramatta is still there and they're both heritage items. Um, the two Elizabeths are fascinating women and they're women from strikingly different backgrounds and they both had to contend with their husband's sharply confl conflicting visions of the future of the new colony. So I'm just doing a little reading of an abridged part of the book where Elizabeth Macquarie, who everybody knows as Betsy, travels to Parramatta for the first time to visit Elizabeth MacArthur. And it's in the first person from Elizabeth Macquarie's point of view. The next day dawns bright and sunny, like most days here. Unlike the gentle sun in Scotland that bathes the fields in gold, the sun in Sydney glares so harshly that it pains my eyes. As soon as Lachlan and I step outside, I feel almost overwhelmed by the hot, cl clammy air and experience a pang of longing for the cool green hills of Scotland, the iron grey North Sea, and even the biting winds at this time of year. Determined to put a good face on things, I climb into our carriage, relieved to be leaving town. After the staff finish loading our portmanteau, we set off towards the mountains on the wide tree-lined carriageway, and soon I'm fascinated to see the undulating Cumberland Plain unfold before us, with its long trembling grasses and spindly shrubs, studded by clumps of trees, which I later found out are forest red gums and ironbarks, wherever creeks flow. Every so often we cross a bridge over a stream and catch glimpses of the Parramatta River beyond and clusters of small farms and huts that settlers have built within easy access to the water. At one point we pass a group of exhausted looking convicts being marched by soldiers towards Parramatta. They'll be used for road gangs or building in Parramatta, Lachlan tells me as he salutes the captain in charge. After an hour and a half, my heart lifts to see the haze of mountains in the far distance and we finally arrive in Parramatta. I'm cheered too by my first glimpse of Government House there, which is a two-storey whitewashed mansion, and even more delighted as we pass through its beautifully kept gardens. Sadly, however, the interior of the house turns out to be in a terrible state of disrepair. What a shame, I declare as we gaze around the derelict lobby. How could Commodore Bly have let it deteriorate so? As we continue our inspection, I grow steady, steadily gloomier. Though the house is well constructed, it's been neglected for so long there's evidence of termite damage everywhere. The ground floor rooms are all in such a sorry mess that I can't quite summon the courage to look at the bedrooms upstairs. It's a disaster, I say bluntly. William Bly must hardly have set foot in the place, and the building has such fine bones too. I'm sure we could make something more of it. Lachlan nods in agreement. Yes, but all in good time. I prickle at the words which seem to me to be his new favourite saying, but I hold myself back from replying. Patience. I really should try to have more. After finishing our tea, we complete our inspection, and despite the rooms upstairs being freshly cleaned for our arrival, their state is as bad as I feared. This will be our second home after Sydney Town, and doubtless we will spend a great deal of time here in the fresher, healthier air, especially if we are blessed with children. So I take copious notes of what needs to be done to make the house habitable for a family, smiling to myself as I picture us here with little ones. Then we set off along the road to Elizabeth Farm. I'm excited to be finally on my way to see Elizabeth MacArthur, impatient to find out what she's like after all these years. As a carriage jolts along the rutted road, I gaze over the green bushland and catch glimpses of the blue of the river beyond. But as we draw closer, I grow nervous. I wonder if she'll remember me, or even recall that we once met. I hope we get on. I would so like to have a close friend in New South Wales. The women I've met in the colony so far are all content to stay at home drinking tea and gossiping, venturing out only to visit each other's homes. 
but Elizabeth sounds a much more interesting woman. When her husband returned to England nine years ago, under arrest after a duel with his commanding officer, she spent the four years of his absence looking after all their sheep, running their estate, and proving, by all accounts, an excellent businesswoman in her own right. Now John MacArthur has again left the colony for England, back to face the courts this time for his role in the mutiny that unseated Governor Bly, and she's again alone and back in charge. I'm sure she could teach me a great deal about the colony and how to live here successfully. I glance at Lachlan beside me, sitting with a faraway look in his eyes. He doesn't seem to mind visiting Elizabeth today, but I wonder if he'd approve of us striking up a friendship, given that John is considered such an enemy of the establishment. Thank goodness our paths didn't cross on our respective voyages between England and New South Wales, because Lachlan had been under orders to arrest him on sight. That wouldn't have been the best of starts for any friendship with Elizabeth. I'm so excited to see Elizabeth, I say to Lachlan. Maybe it's a good thing her husband isn't here now. Lachlan takes a moment to reply. Yes, I agree, he says. I wasn't looking forward to dealing with him, but now he'll be England's problem. Do you think she'll be lonely without him, I ask? She does seem an extraordinarily capable woman, Lachlan says, but it must be difficult for her without him, even though he seems such a difficult, argumentative man. Maybe it would be better if you don't mention him in your conversation. No, 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 I won't, I reply. In truth, I've been wondering what I could talk about with Elizabeth. I've been anticipating our meeting with such pleasure and have such high hopes of a friendship that I suddenly start to grow nervous in case she proves not as keen to know me as I am to make her acquaintance. We reach the MacArthur's house after about 15 minutes and it's a stark contrast to the dire state of our accommodation. Despite being a far more modest single level cottage, it appears wonderfully kept with French fresh paint on the facade, a good roof, some new building work, tidy fruit orchard, orchards all around, vegetable beds and what looks like a herb garden to the side of the home. We climb down from the carriage and are just walking up the path to the front door when a young harried looking woman wearing a dirty apron, her hair escaping her cap, comes out of the house and stops dead in her tracks, looking truly horror struck. I imagine we must be an unusual sight out here in this rural setting with Lachlan in his scarlet uniform and me in my favourite green taffeta dress. Hello there, Lachlan calls. I'm Governor Macquarie and this is my wife, Mrs Macquarie. We're looking for Mrs MacArthur. Is she home? Yes, 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 sir, she stutters. I'll call the, the mistress. Please come in. Thank you, Lachlan replies genially, doffing his hat as a woman opens the wide cedar front door for us. We follow her inside to the lobby where she opens another door which leads into a beautiful drawing room with a small pianoforte in the corner. That's excellent to see. I myself brought a grand piano over with us on the ship, so that will be something we have in common at least. The room also shows Elizabeth to be a woman of impeccable taste. It is decorated charmingly in pale green and yellow. Fresh flowers are spilling out of large vases everywhere, and intricately embroidered cushions are scattered on the chairs. When Elizabeth MacArthur does bustle in, there's a moment's pause before Lachlan jumps to his feet. I walk over to her and greet her warmly. She looks much older than when I last saw her, with a face that's leathery and brown from the sun. She's also wearing a shapeless dress, shabby and faded, and her boots are deeply scuffed and discoloured. Governor and Mrs Macquarie, she exclaims, looking mortified. I'm so sorry about my appearance. I've been so looking forward to seeing you, but I had no idea you were visiting today. No, 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 Mrs MacArthur, I reply. The fort is all ours for appearing out of the blue like this. We should have sent news of our impending arrival. It's just that I was so keen to meet with you, Mrs MacArthur. Please call me Elizabeth, she says, smiling at me. I feel myself flush with pleasure. And please do call me Betsy, I reply. Lachlan quickly launches into all manner of questions about Parramatta, Elizabeth Farm and the MacArthur's famed merinos, until Elizabeth haunts him. Governor Macquarie, I'll have my overseer, Mr Herbert, come and speak to you and show you around, she says. Ah, there he is, coming up the path. Elizabeth leads Lachlan outside and introduces him, before coming back to the drawing room and calling for a servant to bring us some tea. She then gestures me towards a seat at a small table. A moment of awkward silence follows as I struggle to think of something to say. I've looked forward to this moment for so long, but now I'm actually here, I can't think of how to begin the conversation. So you're all alone here? I ask, looking round. Well, not really, she replies, seeming amused. My daughters and their governess, Miss Lucas, live here with me, and we have Mr Herbert, of course, and the servants, and plenty of convict labourers, too. You can't really call that alone. I nod and smile, despite feeling as though I've been subtly ticked off. Oh, Elizabeth, I say, I completely forgot. I have several letters for you from home. 
that's the two women's first meeting, <clears throat> and they kind of they fall into a discussion, an easy discussion. And Mrs. Macquarie tells Mrs. MacArthur she's finding it really hard to adapt and she's feeling lonely and she's kind of surprised that the colony is not more advanced. She was given to believe that it would be a lot more advanced than it is. And, and Mrs. MacArthur seems terribly sympathetic to her and Mrs. Macquarie leaves feeling that she's kind of made a new friend. And then the book later goes on to Mrs. MacArthur's view of that meeting. Elizabeth MacArthur gazes at her departing visitors in wonderment and not a little irritation. Sydney not advanced enough? What on earth did Mrs Macquarie expect from such a new colony? Fine palaces and footmen? And by God, how could she go on so about how hard her life is in the colony? After only a few days, she's already finding it tough going? So it's, I find it really interesting because there's such different women. women. I think at first... Um, they find each other quite hard to take, but then later on we discover that they have a lot more in common than they first thought. And so that's the book, um, Elizabeth and Elizabeth, and um, I very much hope you might get the chance to read it yourself one day. And um, thank you so much to Westwards for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about my book. Thank you.